going to do is just talk today about uh, some of the uh, specifics about how people are using this in ways that you you know you may not have uh, envisaged before. Okay, um, how many people are using sort of the, the higher end uh, HD stuff of those who are using video? So all of using HD. How many are, we, are using mobile um, solutions for for video? We do a bit. Okay. We okay. Buy phones. Right, and it's it's the it's the advent of uh, HD and the advent of, of mobility and even HD within mobility, which is opening up some of these uh, some of these new applications. And organisations are starting to use uh, collaboration technologies in in lots of different ways. You know, it's it's not so much for all of them. Um, about you know just being efficient in terms of your own process. Uh, there are banking groups, for example, who are looking at um, augmenting their their profile in the marketplace as as thought leaders in the areas of retail finance by by you know putting a bit of technology out there um, and having virtual greeting agents when people walk into banks, so you're sort of greeted by somebody in a uh, you know a stand up screen and you can press some buttons and you can be. You can be piped through to particular experts. Um, we have people using it within uh, medical applications, and I'll, I'll talk through some of the some of the detail for that. But being able to get video to the places where where people do work, on the factory floor, in the, the maintenance hall for uh, for aircraft, um, in the IT comms room, uh, and being able to sort of transmit very high quality data, if you like visual and audio data from there, are the things that have opened up lots of these new applications. And I'll talk through some of the, uh, some of the, the specific areas um, in a little while. But um, one of the ideas here is to just get you sort of thinking about uh, what, the, what the, the future might hold for your organizations uh, around video. And it's, and it's not just um, Polycom technology that will provide that. Our strategic relationships with uh, lots of different companies that is, you know, will enable um, some of this innovation. And so we have partnerships with IBM and Microsoft and Siemens and lots of other companies like that, and HP. And uh, I used to be quite you know, impressed with the, the spend of, of Polycom on research and development. You know, there are hundreds of millions of dollars spent every year by Polycom on, on research and development. And, you know, you get quite excited about that until you read how much Microsoft spends on, on innovation and sort of you know some billions of dollars a quarter, um, I believe they spend on that. So what we can achieve through partnership is really you know living off the uh, the fruits of, of other people's innovation as long as we have the the interfaces into the uh, at the correct levels um, you know, technological interfaces into the correct levels at Microsoft, IBM, etc. We can start uh, benefiting from from some of that stuff. And you'll see demonstrations of that uh, a little bit later. Um, in terms of examples, uh, manufacturing is, uh, is one of the areas that uh, we've seen quite a bit of, of innovation. Um, anybody here from manufacturing sector? And the sort of sort of things people are being worried about there is the uh, you know continuous process improvement is one of the key um, sort of focus areas for for manufacturing. Uh, the avoidance of downtime on a manufacturing plant. Um, if you think about a typical, I don't know, a, a, a car manufacturer who's operating a fairly sort of lean, uh, efficient uh, production machine, any estimates for the cost per hour of downtime in an environment like that? How much, how much do you think it costs if one of those places stops working for for an hour. Well, they normally have to work about 40 cars an hour, weren't they? Okay. So a car's what, 20,000? Right. So 40 times 20 is a fairly big big number. Yes, I won't even hazard a guess that's what that number might be. Yeah. Some terrible pressure here. Don't do that. It's terrible pressure. Okay, but you're right. It's, it's you know, it's um, certainly of the order of, of tens of thousands of, uh, of dollars. I've seen some estimates where in very lean manufacturing environments, uh, which means that there's very little buffer stop between one part of the process and the next part of the process. It means that when one part of the process stops, very, very quickly, 
everything stops uh, after that. And um, six hundred thousand dollars per hour was one of the figures I, I came across. Um, if you have, you know, high dependencies on your on your IT systems, regardless of your of the nature of your business, uh, if the order mechanisms between you and the hundreds or thousands of customers out there and go down for a while, you know, how much might you lose? So, being able to identify a threat, uh, which could result in downtime, and deal with that threat uh, intelligently and quickly, is very attractive as a proposition within, within manufacturing. And video enabling the response to a, a threat, uh, which could result in downtime, uh, is quite um, appealing also. We had one, uh, actually, a utility company through here recently, and they were talking about the uh, the hands and eyes program, giving people wearable video conferencing. We have um, we have one of the units here that they were considering. Uh, you literally wear a, a PDA on your belt, and you have a headset which gives you two-way audio and one-way video. So the video goes from you, the headset wearer, back to the experts, no matter where they are in the world, and you can show them what you're looking at in a comms server room. And these people could, can be telling you, you know, that's probably the, the area that's at fault. You know, take that unit out, perform this diagnostic process on that unit. Um, this is how you fix it. This is how you test it. This is how you reinstall it. This is how you bring the system back up again. Okay? And they know that if they can save minutes of downtime, then the you know few thousand dollars of cost of one of these uh, video systems is, is dwarfed by the potential benefits per year that they might get from that. Given that you know it's, it's potentially hundreds of thousands of, uh, of dollars of of risk, if you like, uh, in their process. Um, but in the financial services, uh, yeah, there's some interesting stuff going on in, in retail uh, financial services, particularly uh, you know, even through the the, the tough times. Um, since was it 2007 when we started our tough times, um, there's still been a you know an increase in the number of, of branches um, that most banks um, own and run, and one of the reasons for that is they they know that the the amount of new business they get um, when they continue expanding their their branch network, it's it's you know it's, it's well correlated. Okay, anybody here from financial services, retail? Um, and one of the, it's a marketing thing, you know, when people are more reassured about their, their uh, bank brand, when they see it, every time you turn a corner, if you see, you know, HSBC or Barclays, you kind of go, phew, good, I'm, you know, I'm a Barclays customer, I'm glad, because my money's in there, right, and I want to know that, you know, if I turn around, the bank's gone, I go, I wonder where my money's gone. Yeah, but there is a, there's a natural assumption that it's actually in there, behind that door. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's what the bank said. Um, now, the banking sector, uh, given the, uh, the costs associated with doing business there, um, the amount of customers they have, and, and the revenue per customer that they're getting, um, there's an assumption, I think, I was reading in The Economist uh, a couple of weeks back, that um, something like half the banks, or sorry, half the customers their banks are running are, are non-profitable uh, at the moment, and the costs within the sector have gone up by billions of, of, of pounds uh, per year. So they're having to rethink the mechanisms for expanding branch networks. And, and we've been involved with one bank in Turkey um, who actually had a mandate to provide banking services in all the sort of remote corners of, of the country. And they knew that there was no way we could scale this, let's get 750 square meters of real estate and sort of plonk it you know, in all of these towns and villages around the country. What they've done instead is built these, um, what they call it assisted self-service, I think, where there is a, a person who opens up a kiosk uh, in the morning and shuts it at night and stops undesirables from coming in and just sort of, you know, having their lunch in there, um, and guides people uh, through an interface to the rest of the bank. Okay. So it's, a, it's a, a mechanism where they're greeted, and then the access to expertise within the bank is provided uh, virtually. Um, there's layer upon layer upon layer of identification systems within the kiosk as well. So again, you know, we're interested because of the communication technology and um, that's employed there, but there's lots of our partner technology involved in um, you know, touchless 
town readers and iris readers and uh, document readers so you can roll up with your passport because eventually that machine will actually give you some money and um, so they're they're you know they're determined to find out that they're actually giving the money to the uh, to the right person um so you know lots of innovation enabled by by uh, communication technology within the financial sector as well but in healthcare one of the big areas there, we, we actually issued a press release on this if you're uh, interested in this as a topic area for the Lancashire and Cumbria um, NHS. And they've developed a, a tele stroke network. One of the uh, big issues in, in stroke care is, is the correct diagnosis of the type of stroke that somebody is, uh, is suffering and so that the correct sort of drug regime uh, might be applied. Uh, applied. And I don't know if you're aware, but there's, you know, there's the, the hemorrhagic type stroke where you're bleeding into the uh, into the, the brain cavity, and there's another type of stroke which uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word right, but it's something like ischemic. People out there on the internet can tell me whether I I, um, I pronounced that uh, correctly or not, um, but it's something like that, and it's a blockage associated with the uh, with blood flow. And of course, if you wish to deal with a hemorrhagic stroke, you want to um, thicken the blood to an extent. If you do that to a person who is suffering a stroke, which is uh, as a cause of a, as a result of a blockage, you've just made the problem a lot worse. Okay? So really important that you get the correct diagnosis very quickly. The general practitioners that might exist in the sort of uh, the smaller hospitals wouldn't have those uh, precise skills. So what they've started doing is, is calling consultants, no matter where they are um, on the NHS network or at home, Going back to your sort of flexible working themes for this morning, but uh, there are you know video clips on, on our webpage there, which have the, uh, the consultant talking about working from home on his PC, being able to control cameras that are looking at patients in the hospital and doing a, 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 a preliminary analysis that way. Okay, and you know saving uh, uh, some money and literally saving lives as a consequence of applying the technology in education for those in education. Um, we have one customer at Georgetown University out of uh, Washington, D.C., who've opened up a, a virtual campus in the Middle East, um, and they're now enjoying you know, a hugely uh, improved you know, revenue streams into their organization from selling these executive MBAs uh, to um, students in the Middle East. Um, the students in the Middle East you know, uh, give very good feedback on the the effect of the immersive telepresence technology that they've used. They, they have put in you know, the highest possible order of technology so that the students in, a, in Qatar get you know, literally eye-to-eye you know, -eye contact uh, with the lecturers out of, out of Washington. And there's, there's a, there is a great sense of, uh, of inclusion and parity with the students who are actually rolling up to the campus in, uh, in Washington as well. Okay? Um, in terms of what Polycom does, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in the next slide. But just so as you're aware, the things that are driving Polycom to do what it does it, it are some of these phenomena here. Okay? Um, there is a, a requirement for scale in our solutions, um, which wasn't there before because of the, uh, you know, the amount of, of devices that are coming along that people wish to enable with, uh, with voice and video conferencing. Okay, there was a time when I guess everybody had a had a PC on their desk and everybody had a phone on their desk. You know, there's there's uh, how many people now don't have one of those two things on their desk? Okay. So, so there's nobody here is just using the PC as a voice tool yet. Okay. The day will come, right, where some organisations are just using um, the PC. I mean, you, you might use Skype for for voice. As well as, uh, as well as video, you know. Okay, interesting. Um, but there, you know, there, there are PC-based uh, voice tools that are out there now, and will continue to proliferate. So, so the time will come, I think. Uh, you know, when you're given a choice, what sort of device you might have on your on your desk? You, know, you might choose one. Um, probably the PC. I can see myself doing it with a phone. I'm not sure I can see myself now doing it with a PC. I'll just have a phone, please. It'd be nice. Um, but I'm not sure I get away with. It. Okay, um, so there's lots of devices coming uh, on which people are uh, requiring video, and as a consequence, our ability to allow you to manage all of those devices and allow all of those devices to connect together into a single meeting has had to go through the roof. 
um, over the last year or so. So we now support, I guess, the registration of 75,000 devices um, within the Polycom infrastructure. And of those 75,000 devices, 25,000 of them can be in a, a call at any uh, one time. Okay? So 25,000 concurrent calls and 75,000 devices registered to it. Um, the networks uh, that people are, are using um, for collaboration can be, do you use ISDN for your external calls? No, no, it's all. It's all to IP, okay. Um, very often that is the mechanism that people use, they, they secure their LAN by you know, having a, a different network for external communications, um, which means that you have to be able to support all of these different uh, networks, okay. So, so the ISDN people, and the people on their home phones with their landlines, and the people on IP uh, internally for video, um, all have to be able to connect together. Okay, so there's all those different networks. And then you have all those different applications. So one day, we would love for the Skype users, and the Microsoft Link users, and the Polycom users, and the life size users to all be able to, to, to speak together, um, no problem. And again, you know, that day will come. Okay, and it's, it's, it's got a little bit closer since Microsoft bought Skype, um, because at least now, you know, there's, there's a, a fair chance that Skype might talk to some of the Microsoft stuff. Um, it's an increased chance, I'd say. Um, and, you know, that's one of the drivers of, of Polycom, is to improve the translation capability within our infrastructure as well, okay? Um, and generally speaking, we expect people to want to launch into voice and launch into video from lots of different places. That's driving some of our partnership behavior and some of our acquisition behavior. Um, we acquired a company called Vivu uh, about a year ago, which will allow people to click the call of, uh, of websites in a, you know, a standards-based fashion. So if you're, if you're in the middle of a um, social networking engine, and you see somebody, uh, one of your colleagues, let's say, with a skill set that's kind of attractive to the problem that you're trying to solve at the moment, it's just click the call off that social networking site and your PC becomes the, the communication engine with a bit of polycom technology and some stuff on the network combining to, uh, to provide that to you. Okay? And, and this is what polycom does. Okay? In particular, um, the sort of the endpoint technology, and probably through this bubble here, um, then provides network-based uh, solutions to deliver some of the necessary functions. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk through those very quickly. So you're, you're familiar with the, with the sort of endpoint stuff. That's the, the sort of the audio capture, video capture, and audio video reproduction at the far end. So to take your picture, take your voice, compress it, send it over the network, decompress it at the far end so that you sound lovely and look lovely at the far end, okay? Um, and you can do all that with your data from your PC, okay? So through this bubble then, video collaboration, we're into uh, universal video collaboration. That's the scalability stuff. So we have a, a suite of products which delivers that 25,000 uh, people connected into, into uh, one call, and all of that translation that's required between different networks and different protocols and the like, okay? Um, and that thing that does the bulk of that work is called the RNX. So it's a, it's a bridging device which allows lots of people um, into a single meeting and translates between all the different technical languages that they, they might speak. Uh, the next thing there is, is uh, resource management, which is the ability for relatively small numbers of people to manage remotely you know, thousands and thousands of, uh, of video endpoints and the network stuff. So we have... Um, we have about 4,000 people in Polycom, and somehow we've managed to, to, to acquire 8,000 uh, video conferencing systems. But, um, I guess people must get it very cheap from Polycom or something like that. But, uh, Two for one, maybe. We've got twice the set of Polycom. <laughs> <office. laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got twice as many video systems as we have people, uh, but we have a relatively small team who manages all of that video stuff. Okay, so when something uh, goes wrong, um, and I can't you know, make a call to somebody else, I, you know, call up a couple of guys in our slow office and they're managing you know, practically all of the uh, all of the EMEA uh, stuff. Okay, so small number of people reaching out across the network to manage using a technology embedded in a uh, product we have called CMA, video resource management, virtual virtualization 
is a mechanism for redundancy. Okay, so you have your 75,000 users, and a good number of them have booked meetings that will use some of your your network resources over the next couple of weeks, and uh, certain network-based devices will be used to house those meetings. But if one of those network-based devices goes down, what you would like is a sort of a, another management layer on the network to be able to say everything that was scheduled to happen on that device move it over to the other bank of devices that we have on the network so that those meetings can, can go ahead. So it's, it's a, a redundancy mechanism and it's within a, a part of the solution called DNA uh, that provides that. Universal access and security is, is mechanisms for um, securing the edge of your network uh, so that your, your existing data firewall uh, doesn't have to be touched so much. And you introduce other firewall technology, which is more sort of voice and video savvy. So that's a solution suite called VBP, or Video Border Proxy, which does all of that address translation and uh, addresses some of the security concerns people have going from their LAN to the, uh, to the uh, wider network and the internet. And finally, video content management is an area which allows you to, to capture all of the video stuff and audio stuff that goes on on your, on your network, have it recorded, and then manage that so that if um, I were doing these sessions once a month, um, you guys could go on to uh, you know, some internet-based thing and type Britannic training sessions, and out will come a list. I believe that's available. Okay, absolutely. And if you want to build that on your internet, then there are mechanisms to, to do that um, using polycom technologies. So you can do text-based searches. Um, on your internet for all of the video assets that you've uh, created through you know, video conferencing, video training, and the like. Um, you can edit that stuff, you can tabulate it, you can synchronize the video with particular slides in the, uh, in the presentation um, so that uh, you, know, you can skip through a table of contents and get to the bit which interests you the most. Okay? So that's the video content management aspect of that. And then the other little bubbles here are about the, the interfaces that, that Polycom uh, needs to provide. So the interfaces into the social networking area, one of them um, that we have uh, implemented so far is to a, an application called Jive, which is a, a more sort of business-related uh, social networking capability. Um, mobility is all about the uh, devices that are coming out with, um, with mobility of computing as their primary focus and we're building the applications to enable them to be uh, voice and uh, high quality voice and video. Um, web conferencing, the ability to share your data from your PC in combination with the voice and video applications that we provide. Call control, if you are uh, got a, a voice PDX in your organization right now from um, Avaya or Siemens or Cisco, um, will the Polycom systems be able to register to that? The answer to is yes. So we can, we can interface to all of the, uh, the leading sort of call uh, control platforms as well. And then finally, um, if you wish to start your collaboration, uh, not with a phone call to ask, can we do a video, but with an IM to maybe start the problem, that, uh, start the problem solving that way. I'm IMing you now because you've declared yourself available on the, uh, on the network. There's a little green dot beside your name. So I'm saying you've got the skill set that I think I need for this particular problem. You say you're available right now. Let's kick off something on IM. And then can we escalate that to voice and can we escalate that to video? And so the IM engine will be, will be delivered by somebody else. But when you go voice and when you go video, we would love that uh, to be a sort of a, a polycom application that, that powers that. We're building the interfaces to, to allow that. And finally then, just bear in mind that the, the assumption um, of you having to own all of that stuff uh, in order to achieve you know, good um, UC implementations uh, is um, incorrect. You don't have to own all of that stuff. There is a, a good number of organizations now who will allow you, you know, per use, models, uh, payment models for access to bridging services, uh, recording services, and all that good stuff. Okay, so there is a, um, you know, a lots of different models. Okay, lots and lots of different uh, ownership models. Um, one is you own everything. 
In other words, you own nothing and you lease everything, and in between there's the possibility of you know having endpoint technology that, that uh, you own yourselves and manage yourselves, and all of these sort of higher order services around recording and bridging the lights is provided by something else. Okay? And what OVCC is, is a consortium of network providers and managed service providers uh, who are coming together to define the standards that are required. So that if you, sir, were calling from your system and you're connected to a, a PT network, and you, sir, are on a you know um, Orange business services network, um, who owns the directory whereby you'd be able to sort of find out what the, the contact details of the gentleman is over there? Um, so the OVCC is starting to deal with those sort of issues, that, you know, the, the sort of global directory. What happens when it goes wrong? You, know, you call PT and they call Orange, or you know, how does it work? So there's those sort of uh, SLAs and sort of um, definitions of problem solving, problem escalation processes for for you guys as well. So that's what OVCC is about, um, and. If you do this and you get it all right, uh, and getting it right means having the, the sort of post-acquisition process in place whereby you can tell people that you have the capability now for unified communications, uh, they don't have to travel so much, and encouraging them somehow to change the behavior of years whereby um, they know how to book a travel ticket really easily. Right? Who here travels? on behalf of their business. Everybody. Yeah. And it's really easy to, to, to travel. Do you just call somebody and, and ask them to book your travel or you do that? Simple, isn't it? Um, Except when you miss you. Now, yes, and many, many people in organizations like that. Now you ask the same question of how do you get access to the to the video conferencing uh, technology? If you want to book a video conference between your office in Farnborough and your office in Bristol and your office in London. And I've seen all sorts of processes in place where uh, one of them was you, s you click a, uh, a link on a website and it populates an email and there must have been 25 names on this particular email. And then there was an instruction in the body of the email which said, which said delete the names in the two List, uh, for the people who aren't uh, appropriate for the resources that you want to book. And I said, well, how do you know that? And they said, nobody knows. Right? So basically they send the email to everybody, right, for all the rooms. You could email someone else to find out. And as a consequence, people are getting these booking, I'd like to book a room in Bristol, and this person's gone, I'm in Slough. <laughs> I don't care if you want to book a room in Bristol. Okay? And, and as a consequence, emails are ignored. You know, bookings don't happen. People turn up and there's somebody else in the room and all that sort of good stuff. And then, you know, a year or so after they've had the, the video stuff, they kind of go, it doesn't get used very much. So, you know, we don't, we're not sure what went wrong. And uh, so, you know, you, you do have to be careful about, you know, choosing the right stuff. And I can definitely give you some advice there uh, about what you buy. Um, but after that, you know, you may need some help in, in, in marketing building awareness and building a bit of process around giving people access to the technology. Okay? It needs, needs to come from the top. Absolutely. We Absolutely. tried to do it for a long, long time, and then when our managing director decided he wanted it, that's when it happened. Yes. Absolutely right. And I've seen that in, in a good number of occasions. There was one uh, defence contractor who had you know, literally thousands of you know, highly qualified scientists and you know, research people in there. and. Uh, we, we got the senior team to embrace it by looking at you know, who they're dealing with most and so you can have one and he can have, so it's the MD and the FD, they seem to be in sort of, uh, you know, daily uh, contact, so desktop systems for them and they started using it and then they started saying to their teams, um, you should be looking at this video conference and stuff and one team leader said, yeah, that's a bit difficult to use, this guy said, you're probably you know, one of the most accomplished research scientists we have, and you're telling me that you can't use this video conference stuff. I've been using it for you know, months. You're fired. And this guy, went, <laughs> this guy went, ah, I'll definitely take another look at that. Yeah. Okay, so there's definitely a momentum that builds when you can uh, when you can when you can start at the top, which is very, very powerful indeed. My okay. problem now is stopping it. You don't want to stop it. <laughs> give everybody. Okay. Give everybody two. It's bandwidth. <laughs> Just like us. The grass is the bandwidth is the issue. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and uh, you know, there's bit, bits of technology in our. Um, can we have something called a high profile? Where we've tried to address some of those bandwidth concerns. We can get to high definition um, video resolutions now at about uh, half a meg, which is about which is about half the, the competition uh, rate at the moment. I think. Okay. So when you do all that stuff, you know, you get the right kit, you get the right network in place, uh, and you put it in the right places with the right people. And um, these are the sort of things that can, can can happen in the organization. So you can get the travel reduction benefit of about. 30% on average. This is based on a sample of uh, 300 companies that Lighthouse looked at. But you know, they saw an increase in sales for some companies where the right people in the company got to speak to the customer much more quickly than before. Okay? And the customer didn't wander off going, yeah, okay, I'll come back with your experts here, I'll, I'll see you later then, and never turn, never turn up. That, that was happening again within, within uh, finance retail. What, what I've found is uh, what you can do is you can bring the right resource from both sides uh, of the table together. Yeah. So uh, if you need to bring other people in from the customer side and other people in from your, your business side, yeah. it's a lot easier to do using this type of technology. Um, so instead of having to try and coordinate diaries across multiple people in, in both sets of organisations, very, very easy uh, to pull people together yeah. and uh, also very good at keeping the momentum going. Yeah. And if you start to draw what you need to bring other people in and you can draw them into a meeting, again, based on presence and availability, yeah. really helps with uh, um, uh, decision making time yeah. and, and, and reducing the sales cycle. Yeah. And I think it's a good sort of point to make there about keeping the momentum going. There's, there's, but there isn't a suggestion from us. Um, that you know you don't travel uh, and you don't meet face to face. And I think initial meetings and concluding meetings are still you know very strong candidates for let's get there and uh, open you know discussions and build a personal relationship and then sort of deal with any any last minute objections face to face. But keeping the momentum going, you know, in those in between those uh, those sort of milestones, um, you, know, you can literally be with your customer you know every week as opposed to every every month of the, when, when you require face to face. Okay. Um, okay. So that was it for me. Um, hopefully that's given you a sort of a, an introduction to, to uh, you know, why Polycom is around and why it's doing what it's doing.